I see it. Hey y'all, this is Farley with Rider's Edge Podcast. And today I am very excited to be able to have a conversation with the one and only Emily Miller. Hi, Emily. Thanks for coming on today. Hey, Farley. Thanks for having me. You kind of, you're, this is going to be great. I'm so excited about this. So let's kind of, um, we always start the podcast out with um, uh, everybody telling their own story. So give us the Emily Miller (laughs) version. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a good one. (laughs) Yeah, I I probably wasn't supposed to be a barrel racer. I didn't really come from a rodeo family or anything and uh, was born and raised in Kansas and got a scholarship to come to school at Southwestern. And so I got my bachelor's degree there and I, uh, I wanted to do uh, dental hygiene for a living. I've always just had a fascination with teeth. I'd had a lot of trouble um, with, with that as a child. And so I was always in and out of the dental office and it just kind of created another passion for me. So I started rodeoing a little more. Um, I think 2013 was the first year I bought my, my permit and my card. Um, and uh, and I went to dental hygiene school starting in the fall of 14 and graduated in 2016 from OU. Um, and I've kind of been trying to juggle uh, barrel racing and and work on a regular job. And in 2016, um, I met my fiance and, um, you know, so we've been together, you know, three years now and, um, I guess almost four, I don't know. I think it'll be four in October. So yeah, it seems crazy. That's flown by. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been a blur. It's been, uh, been a lot of fun, but I just kind of try to juggle life and, and family and, and, uh, my passion for horses all, all together. Yeah, that's awesome. I we've known each other for for a long time um, through I mean, for, through the one and only Jana Turner. Um, <laughs> shout out to JT tonight. Um, and, and so you know what I've enjoyed watching about your career is um, you are very self made um, with your horses and and how you've progressed and. Um, you know, watching you um, almost make the NFR and then be able to make the NFR and uh, just very, very inspiring to watch your program and how, how you have progressed and made and um, set out your goals and then achieve them. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. It hasn't been easy. And there's a lot of times I've absolutely banged my head against the wall thinking, why do I still do this? You know, it's frustrating. It's a frustrating sport. And often you ask yourself why, you know, but then you have that run or you have that moment and, you know, everything comes together and it's, it's easy to keep everything going again, but it's been a roller coaster. I mean, it's um, not been easy. It's been a, you know, there's been a lot of highs that have been wonderful and a lot of lows that haven't. And, and essentially it took all of them, um, to get me to the point that I could make the NFR. And that's something I'm really grateful for. You know, it's, um, you know, I don't think that you can be a humble competitor and be successful at that kind of level if you haven't, you know, been at what you feel like is, you know, rock bottom at some point, you know, and, and just questioning your decisions and, and, you know, is this the right thing for me and, and whatnot. And it's, you know, it's all been a learning curve and all of those um, trials and tribulations help pushed me harder. They made me, um, you know, more passionate about it and more driven and more focused. And I think, I think when you get to Vegas and, you know, there's 17,000 people in the stands yelling and you've got to dial it down and remember, you know, it's just one barrel to the right and two to the left. Um, you know, all that comes in, in the play. So let's, let's talk a little bit more about that, um, mental side of competing and, um, you know, how, how you look at things, um, whether you're at a jackpot rodeo going down the road and, and just, um, just talk about that kind of your, your thought process and, and theory of the, the mental side of competition. Gosh, I, I really think so much of barrel racing is mental. Um, you know, I mean, I know granted, like you're only as good as the horse you ride, like you've got to have some great horsepower, but 
but past that, you know, your horse can only do so much without, I mean, you, he has to have a pilot and he has to have somebody he can trust and that can make good decisions for him and put him in the proper situation. And, and I think the mental game, you know, comes in preparing yourself and knowing, um, you know, the, I mean, I, I would say experience is invaluable there as well. Just knowing the arenas to go to when you want to be up, which ones are worth driving by if you've got a bad draw and um, making those good decisions. You know, there's been times I've literally pulled up to a rodeo, looked at the arena and been like, I can't do this to my horse. Like this is not conducive and it's not going to help us achieve our goal and load back up and leave. And like having, that was not something I used to be able to do. You know, I thought that if my name was on the paper, like I needed to run and, and you've got to be mentally strong enough to make those kind of, you know, crucial decisions. And, and um, then also know when it's game time and when you need to take advantage of a situation. I mean, there's, um, you know, I'm still pretty hard on myself. Like if I get a top of the ground draw and I waste it, I'm like, man, <laughs> really wish I could have that one back. Um, you know, and, and so you got to know when to seize the moment too. And, and um, I, I don't know. I mean, it just, it really, over the years, I, I think I've learned so much about um, being mentally strong because it is such a, um, such a roller coaster, and there is a lot, you know, mother nature and, um, you know, your horse staying sound and, you know, being 12th on the ground, trying to compete against somebody that's top of the ground. I mean, there's, there's outside factors that um, you've just got to sometimes set those aside and go out and do, do your job um, the best you can. And, and um, I, you know, it, it just, to me over years and time and, and whatnot, I've, um, I, I've still got a lot to work on. You know, I do. I mean, I, I write it down and, and study it. I read a lot of books. Um, I was just uh, trying to remember the name of this. Uh, I may have to look it up real quick. Um, but my friend Darby Fox, um, she always has great books to read. And, and so when I'm driving, I like to listen to books. And one of my favorites um, is Extreme Ownership. I love that book. And, you know, we're quick to um, blame, blame the ground or, you know, blame the horse being sore or blame our draw or whatever, instead of being like holding ourselves accountable for um, our success. And like that book was so enlightening to me, you know, on how like you can fail yourself if you don't prepare prior, you know, you know what the circumstances are now go make it happen. And um, I highly recommend that book to anybody um, that's wanting to step up their mental game because it really did. It, it helped me quit looking for an out in that sense, like I was, you know, instead of just trying to be like, you know, the blame game, <laughs> um, it did, it, it really was like, no, what could I have done different? Like how, you know, yes, that happened, but that happened because of this. And like, um, you know, people all the time want to commend me for being able to reach down and set up the first barrel. And yeah, and that's cool. That's great. And it saved me a lot of money, but also I get so frustrated at myself for being put in the position and putting my horse in the position to have to do that. If I would ride him to the proper spot all the way up in the hole, we would get by that barrel and I wouldn't have to lean down and set it up. So that's not something I'm proud of. Um, you know, it, like I said, it's something I'm just kind of, I, I'm working on all the time to try to get past that. And, you know, it's, um, I'm, I mean, I'm still, still thankful I have the ability to do it, but it's a, it's a problem that I feel like in, you know, my mental game, I've got to step it up and I've got to trust that horse another step. So that way I'm not put in that situation. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think people, um, looking from the outside in because we like, we like to do that, um, a lot because everything gets so national. Uh, um, televised and there's so many opinions come the end of the year for those 10 days um, but that balancing of being on the road every day and and looking at the ground situation what are my horses doing you know and for you you have a string of horses and and deciding which horse um, you're going to run where and and how they are with their health and wellness and and um, and, 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 um, because it just, it just never ends on the amount of factors it takes to make those decisions. Um, and hindsight could have changed those decisions. 
Um, but you have to, you have to look at all of that um, to put that together and make the best decision for you and your horse at the time you draw up at that rodeo. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so kind of um, taking your string of horses and, and looking at that, um, what, um, what kind of factors what's kind of your program? Do you have some kind of rules that you set that, oh, if I, as I figured this out with Chongo or with Foxy or Bo or whoever, um, you know, do you have kind of things that you kind of look at and then you, and then you change and alter that from all the 40 other factors it takes to go down the road? Yeah, no, for sure. And like, I'm always, um, you know, I try to keep a book on rodeos and stuff and and what the arena setup was like, you know, um, how I felt like the ground was, um, open gate, closed gate, side gate, you know, all, all of that stuff. I mean, it is important. And, um, you know, one thing about barrel horses is they're humbling and you're always learning. And one of my favorite um, things to remind myself is I was scared to death to run Chongo at Pinoka. <laughs> um, I was really trying to get Pipe Ranch across the border in time to run him at Pinoka instead of Chongo. Uh, I just did not think that Chongo would like Pinoka. I hadn't had a lot of success on him in arenas without a wall. Um, you know, I'd ran him at Reno in 2018 and that did not go well. I ran him at Greeley in 2018 and that did not go well. And so, I just kind of decided like he was the way I ride him and it wasn't, it's not something that I think is a fault of that horse, but the way I had been riding him, I could not, I was not setting him up for success in those kind of arenas. And so, um, I couldn't get Piper Ranch up to Canada in time. I'd had him, uh, down in the States just in case I needed him at some rodeos down here. Um, and anyway, and so I was like, well, here it is, you know, I've got to run this horse up here. I got to figure out how to do this. And I studied the videos and I watched the girls that had been successful there. And I was like, I've just got to be quiet and let that horse do his job. And I mean, he, his showing at Pinocchio was incredible. Those were some of the best runs I've ever had on that horse. Um, and so right there goes to show like, you know, we sit here and we think, okay, this horse needs walls and this horse needs deep ground and this horse needs this, but you know, I think as a rider, a lot of times I can set myself up to do a better job jockeying them so they can be successful. Um, I am really fortunate to have a couple of horses to choose from. Um, and I do feel like they have their strong suits. Um, you know, like Chongo hated Houston last year. Uh, I rode him one run. And so I didn't even take him to Houston this year. You know, I, that was not arena that I felt like I could I could change my riding for him. And I had two horses that I feel like are, you know, good for Houston. Um, you know, so it's just kind of, you got to pick and choose and be like, all right, well, if this horse, you know, prefers this kind of ground, then, you know, my odds are probably better, but, um, you know, you can adjust a lot of other factors too. Uh, whenever, you know, you're going down the alley, like, all right, that first barrel is way off the pan, you know, fence. Like I probably don't want to run from the North 40 at, you know, going Mach 90 at it. And that's something I've had to learn, <laughs> you know, that especially when you've got one that can run like Chongo can, um, you know, he, he can get some momentum built up. Bert Foxy, you know, she's so rady. I mean, I could come running from, from the back end and she's going to find a barrel wherever it is. Um, you know, she's so in my hand and so sharp and snappy. And that's why I love her in the little pins. Cause I get a quick reaction out of her. Um, you know, and she's a bigger mare. A lot of people don't realize how big that mare is, but she is pretty good size. She's just, uh, she's just really in my hand, you know, and then, and Bo, I mean, he, I've been running him a little more. He's seven this year. Um, He's really sure-footed, and he doesn't seem to care what's underneath his feet. I um, mean, he handles all different kinds of ground great. So he's kind of been, you know, my loose end horse that has helped me a lot on, um, you know, the arenas that I'm not sure what I want to ride. Um, I kind of lean on him, and and he's really uh, matured a lot. You know, he's put a lot of miles on the trailer last year. He went everywhere with me, and. So that's been, that's been fun seeing him grow and progress. And, you know, Piper Inch hasn't got to run um, quite as much the last few years, but uh, you know, Piper Inch, I mean, that horse will run about anywhere. He's got a big heart and he's going to try. Um, 
try his best for me. And so I've, I've never felt like there was a situation I couldn't trust him in, but still it's, it all, you know, you've got to, got to mull it over and, and try to make the best decision for them and, you know, give yourself the best chance to be successful. How, how do you, Emily, go from one horse to the other? Once you've made that decision on who you're going to run where, um, you've gotten through all of that, that part of it. Um, how, how do you stay sharp and, um, and go, go jockey from one to the next? Well, um, I will tell you that I, I have done that since I was a little girl, and Jana can tell you all about it. I mean, she threw me on whatever horse she had. If she wasn't running it or her sister wasn't running it, I was, that was the one I got to ride. And so from eight years old, they were, they were just, okay, today you ride Digger and today you ride Peg and tomorrow you're riding Dealer and the next day's Elvis. You know, it was just constant. Um, and I'm really thankful for that because it never let me get comfortable and it never really let me get in a habit. I had to feel the horse, constantly feel the horse. But my dad, um, <laughs> he has the best, like, simplified one-liners that usually really irritate me in the moment not gonna lie like there's some times I'm like dad <laughs> I'm not sure this was the right time for this but oh, the next day after I've slept on it I'm like he's right you know and he always is like look and see what horse you're on remember what horse you're on like I don't care if I have to write a post-it note between their ears put a neon flashing sign. This is Foxy. Like, remember what horse you're on, you know? And so I'm like, duh. Right. Like, you know, I mean, it, it's simplified, but you know, it's important too to know that like, Hey, this one is a little bit different, you know, and, and this one's more forgiving or this one's a little stronger. Like uh, Chongo, he can just drop the anchor. Like that horse can be running, flat out and then when he is coming up to a barrel like he is dead run one second and dragging it the next and I don't Yin Bo's a little bit similar to that but Bo's is a lot smoother transaction like it's it's not or transition it's not quite as abrupt um as Chongo's is so there's there's little things that I have to to take into consideration but um yeah just just going by my dad's theory to, um, you know, remember, <laughs> remember what horse you're on when you're going down that alley, pay attention to what color. Um, and they are all different colors. So that's kind of handy. You know, I've got some variation there, so that's nice. Um, you know, but it's, it's been, uh, it's been fun. And of course, you know, most, most all the horses that I've rode the last few years have came from the same training program, you know, different sisters between Kylie, Cassie, and Janae. Um, and, and Renee has told me that too, that they all ride just a little bit different. There's a little tweak here and a little tweak there, um, you know, but essentially the foundation is the same. And so that I think has helped me too. Um, you know, it seems to be a good program that I can ride, you know, and I, I mean, I have to work at it. I go down and ride with them and, and get lessons with them. And, and um, I'm sure sometimes they just, they're banging their head against the wall thinking this girl will never learn. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I do try, try to follow and, and ride as similar as I can to them um, just to make it easier. And so that does, that does help with the switching around too. Well, it's such a blessing to have a good tribe. Um, uh, you and I both have a lot of good people that help us with our riding um, or, or any other um, issue, life issues, rodeo issues, horse issues that we, we are having. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, you gotta have an army of people yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy how much you rely on them in this industry. You know, just, I mean, poor Jana, she's on speed dial all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> yes, I know. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. I think I've gotten off the phone because you were calling. I know. <laughs> yep, exactly. Yep. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Hang on, Emily's calling. Okay, I'll talk to you later. <laughs> right. Yeah, you know that's gonna be like a forty-five minute conversation. <laughs> oh, um, what other what other books are you reading or listening to? Uh, <laughs> or that you have liked in the past? Uh, well, the the one I'm listening to right now, I probably shouldn't say out loud on this podcast. Um, I can. 
I don't know if I can pull it up and, and show it on the deal <laughs> to where. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good it one. Good. It really is. And I, um, I am such a softy <laughs> and I take things to heart really, mm -hmm. you know, it's, and that's something that um, has had to change in the last, I'd say, four months. <laughs> you know, um, like I knew when I got to Vegas, like I needed to shut off my social media and stuff just because, and, and people don't mean it malicious, but, you know, sometimes opinions come across a lot stronger in black and white via keyboard than what it's intended. And you probably wouldn't say that to someone's face. And so, I, you know, of course, being my first in FR, I didn't know what to expect. I dang sure is same thing as Pinoca. I had no idea what that horse would do in that arena. Um, it's so funny because before the NFR started, somebody asked me what horse I was going to ride. And I said, well, I'm planning on riding Chongo for most of it, you know? And they were like, isn't that the one you rode at San Antonio? And I was like, yeah, it sure is. And they're like, you did really bad there. And Vegas is the same as San Antonio. Like it's a similar setup. And I was like, yeah, I understand that, you know, like crystal clear, but you know, so going into, and that I, I totally agree with them. I did, I had a terrible showing at San Antonio. I won one round and ran five times and that was the only check I pulled. So it was, you know, that was, that was a rough go of things. And so it wasn't super confidence boosting going into the finals. And, and I just thought, man, I don't, I don't want to read all those comments <laughs> from people if this doesn't go well. Um, you know, I don't need that. And, and even, even though I was doing good, I still needed to stick to my agenda, stick to my game plan. You know, like, um, I had, I had a plan going in and, you know, and what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it. And, um, you know, I just didn't want to let others affect me or, um, you know, make me change my decision or waiver or anything. And so, um, after the NFR and you know, and it still was hard. People would send me screenshots of stuff. And I'm just like, of course, you know, with the whole Hancock thing, goodness gracious, that was, <laughs> that was a mess. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, you know, I was like, how do I get better at this? Like, how do I get better at just kind of like when somebody has an opinion like that, like smiling back saying, thank you. And then brushing it off and walking on. And, um, I don't even remember. I think it was, uh, Austin's it was one of his really good friends. I've gotten to be great friends with his wife, uh, Nikki, and she suggested that book. She was like, you should read this book. She's like, it's a really good book. So anyway, I've been listening to it. I, I really do like it because it's, um, that is a weakness of mine is being too kind hearted <laughs> and taking everything to heart. And so, um, you know, sometimes it is wise to, you know, just kind of stick to stick to your zone and, and what you're doing and, and your game plan. Um, and not, influence you yes yeah and for the listeners who are listening they're like what book are they talking about um it's the subtle art of not giving and you can fill in the blank because we'll be good kids tonight <laughs> on our little podcast here <laughs> and and that's a whole nother dynamic um that rodeo athletes have to deal with these days is the social media um because the written word has really changed in our society of mm. you, the context, you can't, you can't interpret context um, often when it's typed on the computer from what somebody meant it as and what you may be in a place to receive it as. Now, sometimes it comes crystal clear across sure. there and people are um, not being nice or they are like it's sometimes it's crystal clear but sometimes it it's um can be interpretation and then that can get into a mental game all to itself and and is not helpful towards um your goals and what you're trying to do because um in in a in a post-covid world we're all in the same storm we may not be in the same boat but we're all in the same storm and we're all in this together so let's let's be a little bit kind and 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 cheer for each other sure well that's what my grandpa used to always say if you don't have anything nice to say don't say anything at all and you know that is something that i think has <laughs> maybe been forgotten <laughs> in our <laughs> society today um you know and i know it's okay to have constructive criticism and stuff but um you know there's usually a reason 
that um, people are doing what they're doing. And if they come to you for help, that's great. But like to sit there and, and point fingers, you know, behind the computer screen or the TV or whatever, that's, that, you know, I don't think they realize how much that does impact somebody else's feelings. And, you know, it's, it's, it is getting a little bit, um, it's discouraging to see it. And it's, I do feel like since the virus has happened, like I haven't seen as much of it. And, and to be honest, I've seen, uh, I've had a lot of girls that I've talked to that have really reached out and helped me. I've seen others helping each other. And I think that's awesome that people are like, you know, Hey, these are my favorite bits. This is why this is the horse I use it on, you know, and being really positive and saying, Hey, you should try it on, you know, like if you have a horse that's like this, why don't you try this bit? And, and to me, I think that's awesome for our industry. And, you know, that itself is extremely, extremely encouraging. Um, I love seeing that. So, you know, like you say, we're all, we may be on a different boat, but we're all in this together right now. Um, you know, and it's, it's this, we all do what we do because we love it. You know, horses and rodeo is our passion and, um, you know, we, we all have that in common. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not, it's not a game. Um, it's a game you're always going to play and, and you're not ever going to, um, master. Um, I, I, I watch, um, the legend of Bagger Vance. That's one of my top five movies that, um, is based off of a book by Stephen Pressfield. And it has a lot of that mental hidden meaning. And, and it, even though I've never played golf and I would totally be 10 cup and break all the golf clubs ever in the world. Cause I would throw a temper tantrum. I do like, um, bad Bagger Vance and they, they talk about, you know, um, you just continue to play and you continue to do the best with the environment you have and, and go on to the next. Yep. I agree completely. So let's talk a little bit about um, the physical side of riding and running barrels. Uh, I, I know you um, have a, um, a very good program. And so let's, I want to hear your, your thoughts and, and how, how all this goes down for, for you. I, I am pretty fortunate. Uh, I, I get to marry my physical fitness trainer. <laughs> so he's stuck with me for life. I guess that's a, a good thing uh, for me is, you know, I, I hopefully can always stay in, in decent shape with him around. Um, but we did, we actually met in the gym, um, working out and stuff. And, and he's been able to help me a lot. Uh, it's been kind of a, you know, a learning curve. Um, you know, I remember, I mean, I played sports when I was in junior high, but when I was in high school, I had 13 horses and I had big goals and dreams. And I was like, I either can rodeo or I can play basketball for my high school. And I just didn't think I could do both and do both to the level that I wanted to. Um, so I chose the horses and rodeo and stuff. And, and so I, I mean, outside of, you know, working my tail off in the barn and whatnot, I wasn't, you know, required to do any kind of fitness exercising. And then I went to the Garden City Community College and we had super circuit, which was like a 30 minute deal twice a week. But, you know, once again, there's no training. You don't, you know, you're just going in there on an elliptical or a treadmill or whatever. And, um, you know, nothing that really, um, excels you or makes you better. Um, and then when I came down to Southwestern, uh, coach Bizniski, was like, we have a workout program. And I thought I was going to die. I, I was so sore. I just, gosh, me and my roommates, we would just like lay on the tile floor after a workout because we were so exhausted, so fatigued. Um, you know, and, and that was a definite learning curve. It was great, you know, but it was, it was really tough. And, um, anyway, so that kind of started a little bit of my drive for it. And, and, uh, then I, I got to the point that I uh, figured out if I would read my textbook or my iPad or, you know, I had um, like a study guide on my, my iPad that I could go through and quiz myself. Uh, when I was in dental hygiene school, while I was on a treadmill, I would actually learn better because if I was sitting on the couch, I would get distracted and I would pick up my phone and I would turn on the TV or whatever else I wanted to do besides study because nobody wants to study that. And so I'd take all that, uh, you know, my textbook and iPad to the gym in the morning and I would put it on the treadmill and I would start running and start learning. And before long, I had ran for an hour and I had studied everything I needed to study. So killed two birds with one stone. And, 
And so that helped me get through hygiene school too. Um, it was a great time. You know, I usually went in about five 30 in the morning and, and got a workout in before I went to class. And, and uh, then I met Austin and he was, you know, he was interested in learning about rodeo and stuff. And, you know, and I told him, I said, I, I can't, you know, for a, for a female, I can actually bulk muscle extremely easy. Um, a lot of girls really struggle with building muscle, but that is like the easiest thing in the world for me to do. Like I can lift weights for a week and I can gain five pounds like that quick. Um, so that's been a kind of a fine line of, of tweaking my program. So that way I stay lightweight and agile and flexible and for my, you know, whatnot for my horses, but still stay strong. Um, you know, cause I do, I mean, I, I ride in a lightweight saddle for a reason. Um, I'm a big believer that, that, that does make, a, you know, it does, it helps your horse, um, overall. And man, there's nothing when you get, when you get outran by a hundredth of a second, you're like that cheeseburger that I ate yesterday, <laughs> you know, that always gets to me. <laughs> I am so hard on myself about that. I'm like, dang it, Emily. But, uh, yeah, so I, I work pretty, pretty hard at that. Um, I started, uh, doing some more yoga and stuff too. Um, just, I mean, anything and everything I feel like you can do, um, agility and, you know, work those like fast twitch muscles. That's what Austin and I work a lot. Um, is, uh, like a hit workout, you know, increasing my heart rate and, and letting it go back down and increasing it again and sprints and box jumps and, and all of that stuff. I still lift weights. I just don't, um, lift super duper heavy just because of the way my body reacts to that. But, um, you know, it's, it's awesome to have, uh, somebody with his kind of knowledge, you know, right, right here and able to help me. Um, because it, it has made a big difference for me and my writing. I do feel like there's a tremendous improvement in uh, my core strength, my ability to sit up and my balance and whatnot in the last few years versus five or six years ago. Absolutely. Um, and so how do you, uh, when you're on the road, that, cause that puts another aspect to your workout. So how do you and Austin work on changing that around when you're gone for months at a time? Um, you know, you have to be creative. Uh, that's just use your imagination. And, you know, if you find an open stall door, jump up there and do some pull-ups, do some chin-ups, you know, whatever you can do. Um, a lot of times the rodeo arenas are really close to a park. Uh, I found, so I will put on my tennis shoes and go run down to the park and you can use, you know, the monkey bars, anything like that. Do some tricep dips some push ups. I love, I love to do sprints. Um, you know, you, you can do like, I mean, yoga and stuff you can do right there, you know, right next to your trailer. But, um, I also like to, you know, get a run in and, and a little more active, um, type of workout. And so I love going to the park and anybody that's ever hauled with me, they get sick of it. Cause I'm always like, are you ready to go for a run? <laughs> like, let's, let's go down to the park. And, and, uh, you know, so it's, I'm, I'm, I really, I love to do that. I feel like it starts off my whole day better. You know, um, if I'm, I, and it's crazy, you know, if I, if I can't go get a run in or something, um, how different I feel throughout the day. It's just, it's just a part of my routine. Um, and worst case scenario, you can run, you know, run laps around the trailer parking, um, you know, just to get, just to get your heart going. Um, but it's, you know, uh, I've seen a lot of girls doing stairs, um, in the grandstands, just running stairs, you know, and so any, anything you can do to get out. And I know it's so tempting to just lay in the trailer and watch a movie or something while you wait till it gets closer to perf time. But, um, you know, I, I feel like that's really important and, you know, we work so hard to get our horses 100%. Why not work that hard to get ourselves 100% as well? So changing, um, let's talk a little bit more about kind of your core strength and changing things around um, as you've transitioned to a lighter saddle. Have you had to change your workout around? How has that transition, because that's only, that's only happened in the last little bit, I think, for you on how you've changed um, some of your equipment around? Yeah, so I did. I am. Um, I was toting my saddle up to uh, the arena at Denver and I got a little fatigued and this is, uh, this was in uh, January of 2019. And then I gave it to my dad and my dad carried it the rest of the way and we get to the stall. And he, like I said, he's pretty blunt. He's pretty honest and everything is simple with my dad. Like he's just like, 
why? You know, and he's like, Emily, this saddle is like a team roper could use this saddle. Like this thing is heavy. I am winded. Like, how does your horse run, run with that heavy of a saddle and like compete? I mean, cause I'm not the smallest barrel racer. I'm never going to be like, I typically weigh about 130 pounds, you know, and there are girls that we run against. I mean, when you were standing next to Haley Kinzel and she's 98 pounds soaking wet, I mean, she's already got 30 pounds of advantage on me. Like I know that fair and square right off, right off the bat. And so then I've got this heavy saddle that is, you know, we could have drug the bulls in on him after the, you know, the bull riding. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a heavy duty saddle. And he was just like, I cannot believe this is what you used to run barrels in. And I was like, you know, dad, you might be right. And so, um, I started doing a little research about stuff and that's when I contacted Patty Wellman, um, and she worked for uh, master saddles and they had a, a lightweight saddle that weighed, uh, 15 pounds. And, I literally, I was like, I'm driving through just whatever one you have, something 13 and a half and 14 inch seat. Like I want it. I need something different. I don't really care. And I, we talked about Chongo, like having a little bit different shape back and, and whatnot. And I got a few runs in it before rodeo Austin, but then I won rodeo Austin and I won rodeo Austin by two hundredths of a second. Let me tell you, I got back to the trailer and I called my dad and I was like, I don't know if that saddle was that two hundredths, but I'm telling you, like, it makes me feel really good right now <laughs> to know, you know, had I lost it by two hundredths and been in a heavy saddle, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you, it's always a catch 22, but I feel like I am more confident because I cut 17 pounds off my horse's back switching saddles. And, you know, if you got to take, se yes, yeah, 17 pounds. Wow. That pad was over twice as heavy as the one that I run in right now. Yeah. And so I was like, you know, you take 17 pounds and go try to sprint with it. And it might not feel too bad the first couple of seconds, but then you stop and start and stop and start. Like, and I know they're an animal, but I just can't, in my head, I can't justify you know, I'm like, this just seems like, this seems like too easy, you know, just make this decision and, and save my horse a little bit. Does it, um, wow, 17 pounds. I'm still sitting here with that, that figure. That's, that's a I big know. difference. It is. It really is. And, you know, and I've always been, I mean, if I fluctuate three or four pounds, um, you know, I, I mean, I crucify myself for that. And I thought I just literally switching tack took 17 pounds off my horse's back. That was the easiest 17 pounds I've ever lost in my life. <laughs> so, you know, that was, that was great. But, um, you know, the, the nice thing about that saddle is, is it's got a, a really, the cantle on it is, I don't know how to describe it. It's, it's kind of, um, a little bit almost like old school. Um, but it's got, got almost like a scoop to it. And it, I mean, it's, sit your bottom right there in the saddle and it, it I, I don't know I mean everybody's like how is your balance so good and and I'm like I don't know this I mean this saddle like I feel like I could do cartwheels in it and still lay a square in the middle you know it's just it fits me it fits my style and I am so thankful for it because the last year my riding changed a lot and I was able to help my horses a lot more because I was stable and I was able to sit up and I feel like they can run harder too so so it really wasn't a, um, a big shift in how you feel you're riding. I mean, obviously it was a big positive shift, but not a, um, cause you know, when you, when you get into the saddle debate or the, the chat about that and, and different people talk about different, going through different brands and really you hear that conversation from a, um, because your saddle is a lightweight saddle with a tree. Um, it's not a treeless saddle. And, right. and, you know, you hear people talk about it, a physical difference in riding in a treeless saddle versus a tree saddle, treed saddle. Um, mm -hmm. Did you feel, was there a lot of difference um, for you physically in riding um, from what you were riding in to, to switching to the master saddle? Uh, no, I, I felt like there was improvement just because the way um, the saddle that I had before had a really, really low cantle. And so when Chongo would push off, I almost felt like I was flying off the back. And so this one has a uh, much taller, much more prominent, and it's, it just keeps me seated in there better. And, um, you know, I, 
I like I this is this is the part of the saddle I love the most is when we were in the Thomas and Mac and after practice they let us go you know walk the horses around we'd go we'd strip Chongo's saddle letting go roll because you guys know if anybody's watched any of my social media posts that horse he has the funniest way of rolling and he loves to roll so I can't deprive him of that so we'd let him go in there and roll and then I, I would pack his saddle all the way back to the trailer and you know how far that is it's a long ways but you know that that little saddle was no big deal to pack back that was fine so it it was cake for me and and I could let my horse do what he loved and and um you know I wasn't out of breath by the time I got back to the trailer like I'd have people drive by on a golf course and offer me help and I'm like no this is fine like this is like a feather so no big deal but um yeah I mean it's I do and I will say this and I hate to say sound this way but I am not a saddle snob you know how everybody's like oh we need you know this specifically like this and this like that and and I'm not like I have rode trophy saddles I've rode I've rode treeless saddles um I've used rope and saddles you know I rode cutting saddles like I I'm pretty flexible um you know when I go to order one that's what Patty she's always like you are the easiest person to make a saddle for Cause you just, I'm just like, whatever you want to do with it, it's fine. You know, like that's the tree we need for the horse. And, and I don't care what color scheme or, you know, if you want to put a back cinch on it or not, I don't care. Like whatever you want to do is, is great. And she's like, this is just too easy. And she does a fabulous job. So I just let her do her thing. And, um, I just, you know, make sure I try to make it look good out in the arena. So it's a, it's a pretty good partnership. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, Emily, let's talk about some of your other partnerships of how, what, um, cause it takes, it takes an army of people to get down the road, but, um, you have a really good army behind you. So let's kind of talk about who helps you get down the road. Sure. So, um, since we're talking about, um, equipment right now, uh, with the saddle, I'll just move uh, right onto the saddle pad. I've been with Darla Schneider for years and, you know, she, she's a great friend and I am so thankful that we are able to have a sponsorship agreement together as well. And it's just always fun when you can do that with people that you really care about. Um, you know, and she offers a great, a couple different options on felt pads and I've, I've used them since like 2013. I mean, basically since I started pro rodeo down here, I started using Darla's stuff and, and I've never looked back. And then, um, I started using ortho equine. I believe it was right after the R and CFR in 2017. Um, I got to talking to them. Um, anyway, and I love Jenny. She's, she's a, she's just a boss babe, you know, she's a, a very hardworking, you know, made in the U S like, um, uh, American girl that is seeing out her dream. And, and she has a lot of products. Um, you know, she ha has supplements and, and she has saddle pads and cinches and stuff for horses. Um, I primarily use the splint boots, um, the cinch, and then she also has these, um, polo wraps that are awesome for any kind of inflammation that your horse could have or whatever. Like if I've got a horse with a swollen leg, I um, wrap its leg in that. And it's, it's a wonderful deal. I mean, she, she really, um, she has it, has it pretty well nailed. I've, I've used, um, and I, you know, I, I have, I've used all the other brands and I've never had a boot that has kept the dirt out, kept my horse's legs dry and cool, you know, even on a hot summer day, like they're not nasty when you go to pull them off. You know, and I just always think like, how irritating is that got to be if they're sweaty and sand in there and stuff? And anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, I've tested them in the mud and the dry and the heat and the cold and, and they're, they're tough. Um, so then moving on to uh, joint supplement, I've used Steerwalt uh, Superflex for a couple years now. I think joint supplements, uh, extremely important, uh, you know, doing what we do, if they have bad joints, uh, you're, you're going to struggle. It's not going to be something that um, that works out for you. So I just think keeping them on a daily joint supplement is, is uh, very important. And I've had the best luck with them. I, like I said, I've been with them for a couple of years. The horses eat it good. Um, you know, I'm not having to inject as often. And so that, that to me is really important. Um, gut health, uh, I, I've used Vitalize for three years now. Um, I learned very quickly on the road that, ulcers are a thing and they're a major thing and horses stress. And when you put them in the trailer and drive all night after a run and unload them and to run in morning slack and they're in a different place in a different environment, um, it takes a toll on them. 
you know, and then 4th of July, you know, I, my goodness, the fireworks scare me half the time, you know, they don't understand what's coming. And so that kind of stress, it can eat a horse alive. And it cost me for several years before I figured out why my horses were having so many problems out on the road in the summer. Um, and so that's been awesome to have them stand behind me because, you know, it's in my horses for some reason, Chongo is super picky. Now, Foxy and Piper Ranch Bow, they're not too bad, but you know, Chongo is very picky. So for him to eat something is good, you know, and, and he does, he always is cleaning up. Uh, I use the Alamin uh, gel or paste every, pretty much uh, every day at home. And then the recovery gel on the road. Um, that's, those are the two products I like from them. Um, I recently got to sign with Purina um, right before the NFR. And that was uh, wonderful because uh, Chongo, he's a, he's a hard keeper and he's picky and he would go off feed every time we went on the road. And I just, it broke my heart because he'd sit there and he'd have the same grain in there and I'd switch it out and he, I mean, he just wouldn't touch it and he would lose weight and it just, it was so tough to keep him away from home. And uh, a friend said, Hey, I've got a couple bags of this ultium gastric care. And, you know, she's like, if you want them, like you can take them and try it. And uh, I tried him on that and he inhales it. And I have never looked back the whole barns on it. Um, I switched all of them would have been at the end of February, first part of March last year. And that's, you know, that's right before my whole year took off. I mean, that was right before, you know, Rodeo Austin and Corpus and, and the summer run and everything. And that's when I started really winning, but I think my horse was comfortable. Um, you know, so that, that really does, um, does make a difference. Um, moving on to, uh, the horse itself, um, Nangmas Quarter Horses has stood behind me for the last three or four years. Um, I, I bought my first horse from them in 2015. That was Pipe Ranch. And, um, they, you know, it's been a, been a great deal. I mean, you know, he's not, Bucks Hancock dude isn't the most world-renowned stud uh, to everybody in the world, but he's the best to me. Um, you know, I, I have had great luck with horses sired by him coming through that program. Um, I think he's very underrated. Uh, he is the beautiful, good-looking stud and, and uh, yeah, puts a great mind on him, and they are so athletic, and they, um, you know, the road mentally is easy for them. I, I mean, it, their horses can be young and they're having success at the biggest, you know, most exciting levels of rodeo. So, um, you know, I have big, big shout out to him because that, that whole program has changed my life. I mean, truly these horses are incredible. Um, then on to health and wellness, um, with me, um, I, I'm thinking is maybe 2014, 2015. So about five years ago, um, I switched to a health product, um, the Zingular company, um, under my friend, Robin Packard. And, uh, I take the probiotic it's called action every day. Um, I struggle a lot. Um, I always have because I used to not make the best decisions on food and, um, would have really bad gut pains. And, and anyway, since I started this system that has subsided substantially, you know, and it, I mean, I was that kid that took Pepto-Bismol to school every day. You know, I just always had such an upset stomach and, and, um, these products, they have a, I mean, an extreme wide variety, like literally anything and everything. If you have anxiety down to, you know, if you need more energy or a, you know, probiotic or, uh, whatever, I mean, they, they've got it, uh, to curb your cravings, protein powder, you know, they make it anyway. And I've just kind of, I've got my like five favorite products I use pretty much on a daily basis. And, um, that's what helps keep me feeling a hundred percent and, um, you know, helps me maintain my weight as well. Um, then the clothing that I wear, um, I, uh, also signed with cinch before the NFR. Um, I love cinch clothes. I've always loved cinch clothes. Um, they, I mean, they look great on Austin. They look, you know, like, I feel like they look great on me. So, uh, and they're comfortable, they're durable. Like I'm, you know, I'm able to, to do the splits and lift my leg around barrels and, you know, <laughs> have, you know, all the range of motion I need. So I'm, I'm all for it. I love the cinch. Uh, a lot of people ask what kind of pants I, the style that I use from cinch and it's the linden trouser. Um, I really like those. Uh, they, I think I had like 10 pairs that I took to the NFR um, just so I'd have plenty of jeans to wear uh, that were that style. And um, then I think I am down to my final two um, nutrient ag solutions and American ag credit. 
And um, I literally couldn't rodeo without these two sponsors. Um, truly, I couldn't. Uh, they are amazing sponsors. They've been wonderful to me. Uh, they've been wonderful to my family for years. Uh, my dad is a farmer in Southwest Kansas and our farm literally runs through, you know, the operating loan in American Ag Credit. And um, it's, it's just incredible to have them not only, you know, help us um, do, you know, make a living at home as, as farmers and ranchers, um, but also supporting me in another agricultural profession, you know, like rodeoing and, and going down the road that way. And so, um, if anybody has any questions on American Ag or Nutrient Ag Solutions, uh, feel free to holler at me because they're, they're awesome people. Um, and they, they want to see the ag industry succeed. So I think, I think that's all of them. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, Emily, I want to say thank you so much for taking the time to just sit down and chat with me. I, I, I love having conversations with people and, and learning um, their tricks of the trade because um, I feel like knowledge is power. And so the more we can just have conversations, we can kind of push everybody forward. Absolutely. I'm so glad you had me. I'm glad glad that we were finally able to, to get together and do this. I know, I know it's been a long time coming and, and I appreciate our friendship and, and uh, I had a blast. So thanks for having me on. All right. You are welcome. I'm so glad we were able to do this. So thank everybody for listening today to the Rider's Edge podcast. And as always, I will see you down the road.